eternal Father, for the sake of the death and resurrection of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, Glory to Jesus. All glory to Jesus. Praise God. So dear brothers and sisters, this morning let's focus on the first reading. It's very instructive. So we're told that those days the number of Christians or disciples, they were called disciples then. Everybody who followed Christ, believed in Christ, was called a disciple. So their number was increasing. It is not going to, they are not going to be called Christians until, I think, Acts 11. In Antioch, in Pisidia, when some people will now call them Christians. But for now, they are all disciples. So their number increased. And with the increase in number comes or came some challenges. That's, it, that's, that's one of the things with um, with growth and progress. Every growth or progress also comes with a challenge. When you have a little baby, the baby cannot sit. The baby is always in your arm, right? Even sometimes you are wishing you have to do something, but the baby is always there. Okay, now the baby grows, the baby can crawl or walk or sit. That is progress, right? But now you have to worry about the baby crawling into fire or taking a knife to injure himself or herself. So with every growth comes challenges or problems. And this is why human beings can never, ever, ever be satisfied. No matter the progress in the world, you can, we can never be satisfied by material. It's not possible. It is not possible. The day you are waiting for things to be all right, it is never going to happen. Experience has shown that. Okay, so what is the problem? Some Jews, or the ones who consider themselves the original Jews, they lived in Palestine and Jerusalem. They've not traveled out. Then there were some Jews who were diaspora Jews. They had traveled out, outside the Jewish territory. You know, normally during the Pentecost, all of them will come and stuff like that. So, this particular Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, these people came and helped Peter preach. So, this problem is coming from those who were converted from Peter's preaching too, and all that. So, they have grown. Those ones who are called the Hellenists, Hellenized Jews. Hellenized Jews are Jews that have learned the culture and the language of other countries. They were called Hellenists. In fact, most of them couldn't even speak the normal um, uh, the, the common language spoken in Palestine, which is the land of the Jews then, was Aramaic during Jesus' time. Jesus spoke Aramaic. But the Hellenists couldn't speak um, Aramaic. So they were actually foreigners, just like some children born abroad. Maybe Yoruba parents relocate to America, give birth to all their children. They, if they don't teach them their language, when they come back, they cannot speak. So... So there was complaint that during the sharing of food, the Hellenists' widows were neglected, but the Jewish widows were given. So um, should I say nepotism and favoritism did not start today? Oh. We don't know for what reason they were neglected, that the other ones got first and stuff like that. And it was a big problem. It was going to tear the church. And they brought it to the apostles. What were they to do? It was a big problem. The apostles already have their primary function. But this one too is an important function in the church. And they decided that, okay, we cannot neglect this problem, but we can also neglect our primary role, which is to preach the word and for prayer. So you have to choose among yourselves seven people filled with the Holy Spirit, and then their names were mentioned 
and stuff like that. And that problem, I think by God's grace, was solved because we didn't hear about it again. So what we learn from this, just three things I want to say briefly. Number one is prioritization. Prioritization, priority. We must prioritize in life. This will not be the first time you are hearing such what We must prioritize. Somebody say that the most important thing in life is to let the most important thing be the most important thing. The most important thing is to let the most important thing be the most important thing in every aspect of life. So the first thing the apostle did was prioritization. They said, we cannot neglect the preaching of the gospel in favor of sharing food. So prioritization. You must set your priorities right. You must set your priorities right. You know? You, can't, you are a married man. You are a married man. But you are jumping up and down all the whole states in Nigeria in the name of crusade. Tomorrow you are in Abakiliki doing crusade. I have next tomorrow you are in uh, Kano. We finish from Kano, you go to uh, Meduguri, from Meduguri to Lagos and all of that. Sometimes you are not in your house for two months at a stretch. And you do this, you feel that you are doing the work of God. No. Your priority is your family. Because you are a married man. In fact, one of the problems with such people, we have them in the Catholic Church. We have them. One of the problems of such people who neglect their families in the name of doing God's work, their problem is when you prioritize your gifts above your calling or your vocation, it's a big problem in Christianity today. People prioritize their gifts or their charism above their calling or their vocation. Marriage is a vocation. It's a vocation. A vocation is a call. There's another word for it. Just like the priesthood or the religious life. And you must give your all, your all to it. In fact, in Matthew chapter 19, marriage is so, so serious that when Jesus thought about the indissolubility of marriage, that one is not negotiable. If you remember, go to Matthew chapter 19. The apostles... Listen to him when he finished teaching without compromise. Then they said, if this is how marriage is serious, then it's better not to marry. That's what the apostles said. They said, it's better not to marry. And Jesus said to them, well, it's not everybody that can accept this. That some were born eunuchs, some were made eunuchs by men. Some were also made eunuchs uh, for the sake of the kingdom. In other words, Jesus is saying, it's not everybody that is called to married life. But anybody who is called to it must stick to it. So you can't prioritize your gift. That you have the gift of healing does not mean you will sacrifice your marriage going up and down, everywhere, to the negligence of marriage. You have lost your priority. You have the gift of uh, preaching. You have now become the global preacher. If you don't go to uh, Lagos and preach, people will go to hell. You know? We have them in the Catholic Church. They prioritize their gifts above their calling. Even among priests, my vocation is priesthood, is holistic. Then maybe I discover that I'm gifted with uh, uh, healing. What is the next thing? It's not crusades, up and down. There are some priests who have prioritized their gifts, their charism. Your charism is the gift that the Holy Spirit gives you, First Corinthians chapter 12. And this gift can be given to anybody. The fact that you have a charism does not mean you are called to ministry. In fact, it is said that the charism is given for the good of the community. The community you belong. It's not everybody that will have the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit, but every community will. Every community does. And God has been so generous. So, Every time Father is on the road, there are some that even leave their parishes on Sundays. 
You know all that father does is go healing and all that. Your people do not see you for counseling. They do not see you for other important issues of the marriage. You have lots of priority. You have prioritized your gift above your calling. It's a problem even in the Catholic Church today. You know, so you have a man who is married in the church and uh, because the Holy Spirit dashed him, the gift of speaking in tongues or the gift of preaching. He has begun, he will attach minister to his name. He's no longer Mr. Uh, Mr. Ifani uh, Okeke Okonkwo. He's now evangelist or uh, prophet. Ifani Okonkwo. Okonkwo, he said, that's why I'm using his name. You know. You prioritize and you neglect your family. Then the second problem is commercialization. Many of them are not making a living out of the gifts, which is not supposed to be. So that's not how it was supposed to be in the early church. And this is what is responsible for proliferation of churches. A member of Christ's embassy speaks in tongues or discovers he or she has the gift of her healing. What is the next thing? We will put another church. And then change the name, maybe from Christ Embassy to become Christ Envoy or Christ uh, um, uh, chance, Chancery or Christ, uh, Christ, even Christ Airport. Self. This is the only place where miracles land and take off. Or this is where your prayers take off and come from heaven. It's a problem in Christianity. They've commercialized the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It has become their means of livelihood. And that's why some don't play with it. They can never stay in their original church once they see themselves manifesting such gifts. That you have a gift. I mean, a charismatic gift of the Spirit does not mean you are called into ministry. Ministry is much more than that. Vocation is much more than that. So I'm saying that if you're a married man, marriage is very crucial that in first Corinthians, in first timothy chapter 3 saint paul made it like a standard for even choosing bishops of the church that the bishop of the church must be a married man to one woman who takes care of his family in other words you can't even be a priest if you do not know how to take care of a family in other words the family is so important that for the priests you are told to look at how a married man takes care of the family and that's why catholic priests do not marry you are married to your parish your church so priority we can't be jumping up and and see the problem if father Loma is gifted with uh, healing he wants to travel to lagos every weekend or to onicha and all of that in that onicha or lagos there are many other people who also have the what the gifts so your priority is your parish but you will leave it jumping up and down, going to places where you already have people who even have those gifts this is also part of my problem with the proliferation of churches. You are going to open church in a place where you already have 10, 15 churches. So we must never prioritize our gifts or charisms or passions, so to say, or your flair above your primary calling, no matter what that may be. Everybody we must find a way. You are doing business Remember, you're a family person. You have to prioritize and not let one suffer. We are Christians. What is our priority? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom and what? And his righteousness. And other things shall be what? Added. Other things are added. You can't seek those other things. Those are the things that will be added. In fact, those are the things you shouldn't even think about while going to church. Seek first the kingdom. That means the priority is what? The kingdom. And what is the kingdom? Romans 14, um, um, uh, verse 7, or is it 17? The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is why you go to church. This should be your primary focus for church. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It can't even be for healing. It can't even be for miracle. It can't even be for prosperity, as we are told. Don't even make any other thing the primary motivation or incentive for going to church. He says, seek first the kingdom. In other words, all your energy must be towards all this. But today, what do we do in the church, in the Christian church? Who is seeking the kingdom first anymore? Is the kingdom second? 
The things that would have been added to us, those are the things we are seeking. Have you seen any crusade where the title of the crusade is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit before? It can be. That would be how to roast your enemies or how to make it in life, how to be the first and not the last, how to be on top and not at the bottom. We are not seeking the kingdom of us. We have lost the priority in Christianity. That's why Christian churches do a whole lot of things. Sure, we are seeing them, but some are wrestlers, some are actors. We do all sorts of things in the churches, yes, because we are no longer seeking the kingdom. No more priority. What people are looking for now is number, fame, popularity, the money that comes with it, and stuff like that. And Christians are accomplices. That's why God is watching us. Sometimes people will think that, hey, first prophet, one day God is going to go. God, God is just watching all of us because the Christian people, they are the accomplices themselves. Jesus said, the sheep that belongs to me does what? Listens to my voice. In other words, if he refuses to listen to my voice, that's his problem. I lead them and they follow me. So if you decide to listen to the voice of other people, God will be looking at you. Even if eventually they harvest your head for ritual, or they defraud you of all your money, that one is your problem. But when you prioritize the kingdom, you will not be in danger of falling into many of these deceptive gospels that are going on. So Christians must prioritize righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Preachings in churches should be how to make people better, not how to make you richer. If you want to be rich and prosperous, you don't need to come to the church. You don't have to come to the church. In fact, you don't even need to believe in God or to follow Jesus to be rich. That's the hard truth. But we have replaced the gospel. The, the church has become like where um, all material problems are solved and become the primary incentive for going to church. That shouldn't be the case with us. We must stick to it. Seek ye first the kingdom and his what? Righteousness. Another thing shall be what? And, then, and the truth is that those who are seeking the kingdom first, their life is not less in quality than those who are seeking other things. In fact, those who are seeking the kingdom first, their life is even better. You are a student. Prioritize. You are not in school for fashion parade. So much so that your life is miserable because you are not wearing, you are not putting on the, the trending clothes. Or you are comparing yourself with others. You did not go to school for, uh, what do they call it? For beauty contest. You went to school to do what? To learn. That should be your priority. Any other thing is... Jara, you should take the, uh, the backstage. Same thing with government and all that. You know, even, uh, in, in, even as a priest, I still have a priority among my duties. My priority is not just to build public structures to the detriment of feeding and nourishing the spiritual life of the people. You know, so you must get your priorities right. Get your priorities right and stick to it. Don't let anything take your attention or your focus away from you. So that was the first thing the apostles did. The second thing they did is they avoided the fallacy of either or. There is the fallacy of either or. Some people see life as either black or white. That's the fallacy of either or. Life is bigger than black or white. There are gray areas. So, it was like they were to choose between preaching the gospel and sharing food. If they choose to preach the gospel, you will neglect sharing food. If they share food, you neglect uh, preaching the gospel. So, either sharing food or preaching the gospel. No, the apostles avoided that. Life is not about either or. Life is also both and. You can do both and. In other words, you don't sacrifice one value for the other. You don't arbitrarily create a hierarchy of values and sacrifice one for the other. It is like in Matthew 22, when the Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, they wanted to trap him. They said to him, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? What did they, they were looking for either yes or no. Abby? And either of those answers would have put Jesus in, into big trouble. 
either of those answers. If Jesus said yes, it can only be either yes or no. If Jesus had said yes, he would have been in trouble. If he had said no, he would have been in trouble. But what did Jesus say? He said, give me the coin. They gave him the coin. He said, whose head is here? They say Caesar. What did Jesus say? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And to God what belongs to God. In other words, giving to Caesar shouldn't stop you from giving to God. And giving to God shouldn't stop you from giving to Caesar. They are not mutually exclusive. It doesn't have to be either God or Caesar. It can be both God and Caesar. So don't live your life on the fallacy of either or. Sometimes you are presented with options and all you see is either or no. There are other options. Don't let your mom or your wife make you choose between one. Some, sometimes some men have that problem in marriage. Abby? Some men are taught between choosing between their wife or their mother. No, it doesn't have to be either or. Don't choose between your wife and your mother. To your wife, you are a husband. Be a husband to her. To your mother, you are a son. Be a son to her. Don't let them let you choose between the other. It's not possible. In other words, don't take what belongs to your wife and do what? And give to your mom. And vice versa. Even if your mom is living in the same house with you, don't let her take the place of your wife. She cannot be the one to decide what will be cooked in the house. She cannot be the one to this. Some men even give their, their mother money to be given to their wife to go to market. That's, that's terrible. Either your mother or some even tell you, you can't come between me and my mother. But your mother is coming between you and your wife. So you have allowed yourself to be boxed in the fallacy of either or. No, you can, it, they can be both and. Be for your mom a son. Treat her the way sons, the Bible says that children should do what? Honor their parents. Honor your parents. And a good wife will not stop you from honoring your parents. Then don't let your mom stand in the way of your wife. Your wife is the queen of the family. You are the king. Both of you make consultations. Your mother is in the committee of uh, uh, family. They have their role and stuff like that. So don't don't let life, don't live by the fallacy of either or. The apostles did not do that. They did not neglect the sharing of food. It is very important. This is an important part of our ministry. They did not neglect that. And neither did they neglect the other. So, my primary duty is to feed you spiritually as a priest. But you need a comfortable church. Or a place that's comfortable for worship. So I have to find a way of not neglecting feeding you with the word and the sacrament, and also not neglecting building up the physical structures of the church. And how does that happen? That's why you have project committees in the parish. You have St. Vincent the poor members in the parish. They are formed to also help and do all of that. So don't live your life in either or. Whenever you are in the dilemma of either or, open your eyes and look. There are other options. Don't be boxed in it. Some people, it's either social life or spiritual life. You are so spiritual that you have no social life. For you, it's either spirituality or social life. You sacrifice the one for the other and you think you are doing yourself uh, good. You don't have time to relax with friends. You don't have time to unwind. Sunday you are in church, if it is when church was on. Okay, good Christian, we applaud you. Monday, you are in church. Tuesday, you are in church. Wednesday, you are in church. Thursday, you are in church. Friday, you are in church. Saturday, you are in church. Sometimes God is even tired of seeing you in the church. Mm. When there is village, you, can, you will not create time for village meeting where you socialize with no members of your, of, 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 your, of your place who are also going to be of help. You don't have time to hang out with friends, to go out, and you don't do sports. You don't, you all, and you think you are helping yourself. Either or. No. You can be both spiritual and also what? Social. Jesus did that. He went for parties. 
That's why the Pharisees accuse him of being a gluten and a drunk. They could see Jesus drinking wine. Some Christians don't want to believe that Jesus ever drank alcoholic drink. They never ever want to believe that. They saw Jesus drinking and eating and making men. That's why they called him a gluten and what? And a drunk. You can't call somebody who drinks juice a drunk. Have you seen anybody who got drunk with juice before? They call him a wine bibber. That's a drunk. Nobody gets drunk with Coke or Fanta or Kunaya. That's why Jesus was called a drunk. He socialized. You now know God and you are holier than Jesus from Monday to Sunday. You don't have any other things. For you, life is either or. It's always either or. Either this or that. No, no, no. Life is bigger than that. It's a spectrum. You can find different colors, multiple in it. You know, open your eyes. So don't sacrifice one value, one virtue for the other. Matthew 23, 23, when Jesus was uh, castigating the Pharisees, he said, what betide you? Scribes and Pharisees say, you tight your mint and cumin and dint. In other words, you pay your 10% of even the smallest things, but you neglect the weightier matters of what? Justice and peace and stuff like that. He said, this you should have done without neglecting the other. You know, you are a very charitable person in the church, or sometimes you buy food and distribute to people. But at the same time, you steal public money. You know, and then you take consolation from the fact of, of giving out to charity. And most of what people give out in charity is usually less than even 1% of what they have stolen. You are sacrificing what? Char you are sacrificing uh, justice for charity. Does it not even occur to you that if you people have not been stealing public money, there would have even been no need for charity cases? If the government in Nigeria had prioritized justice, which is given to everybody what is their due, there would have been no need for charity. Most cases, charity cases would have been very, very minimal. You can't go and steal billions of naira that would have been used to better the life of millions of people. Then you come to church or mosque and donate some few um, this thing and believe that you are doing something. You know, you are sacrificing justice for charity. And when you sacrifice one value for the other, it will have a way of having um, a counterproductive effect. Don't sacrifice. Even God himself will not sacrifice justice for mercy. I think this uh, second readings, I mean the um, resolution says, for the Lord loves justice and right, and his merciful love fills the earth. The God of mercy is also the God of what? Justice. That's why we are not going to escape justice on the day of final judgment. Amen. 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 Are you listening to me? Don't sacrifice one value for the other. Don't sacrifice firmness for mercy. Mm. If your child does something that deserves punishment, mm, don't say, oh, the Bible says, be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. I have stand up. No. Punish the child appropriately. Punish the child appropriately. And tell him why you are punishing him. Otherwise, that child will grow with the mentality that all about life is what? Mercy, mercy, pity, pity. He will never understand justice and responsibility. Don't sacrifice one value for the other. And finally, the indispensability of the Holy Spirit in the life of every Christian. The seven people that were chosen, they said there must be people full of what? Faith and the Holy Spirit. So, sometimes we think that those who need the Holy Spirit are only those who are preaching or healing and doing all that. But you can see that St. Vincent de Paul, they need the Holy Spirit even more than us. What those seven were doing is what St. Vincent de Paul is, uh, does in our church. Today. And he said, those who should do that must be full of the Holy Spirit. And that means 
A Christian cannot do anything right if he or she is not led by the Holy Spirit. The only secret to an excellent Christian life is the Holy Spirit. You can see that when those people filled with the Holy Spirit were chosen, we didn't hear about the complaint again. They did the work excellently well, beautifully well. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. Mark chapter 7 verse 37. They describe Jesus in such glowing terms. They say, he has done all things well. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. He enables us to do all things well. Whatever be your duty, once you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, you will do it well. So the importance of the Holy Spirit. So everybody needs the Holy Spirit. Whether it's the cleaner, for the cleaner to clean well, the cleaner must be led by the Holy Spirit. The church warden, for the church warden to be a good church warden in the church, he must be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that leads the parish priest when he's preaching on the altar is not less than the one that leads the lay reader when he's reading here or the man who is even working at the microphone stand and stuff like that. All of us, we become completely um, inefficient both in our duties and in our life without the Holy Spirit. So in John 14, Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will send you another advocate. Who is your advocate? Another word for advocate is what? Helper. That's what the Holy Spirit is. Helper. You remember that in Genesis chapter 2, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him what? A helper. So what the woman is to the man, that is what the Holy Spirit is to us, even in a more fundamental way. That means without the Holy Spirit, you are helpless. You can't do anything. In Isaiah chapter 9, it says, A shoot shall spring from the stalk of Jesse. And the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him, the Spirit of knowledge and wisdom and insight, knowledge and counsel, the Spirit of excellence. So Jesus did everything well because of the Holy Spirit. If you are not doing it well, whatever be your work in the church or anywhere, you are not led. Romans 8, we must be led by the Spirit. Otherwise, we cannot do anything that will please God. Romans 8 from verse 5. He said, the flesh cannot. It does not want to because it does not have the capacity. But those who are led by the Spirit. So when these seven took up the responsibility, everything became fine. That's what the Holy Spirit accomplishes in our life. We have to be led by him. So um, sometime I was arguing with some of my members in the charismatic renewal and the intercessors say that the most important ministry is the intercessors. They are the ones that, uh, without them, I say, what about the, the, the stewards? The stewards are like the church ones. They say, no, those ones are not important. And that they are just to this person. You are a very wrong person. The stewards are as important as who? As intercessors. And all of them work through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, as far as God is concerned, there is no work that is less of less value. So much so that you can pick anybody, anyhow. You can say, okay, so we are looking for security men now. Uh, let's just go take any, anybody out there. No. So, when you take anybody out there, you are also saying this person is not important. You are not going to accord the person respect. That's why many people can respect the priest on the pulpit, but they will not respect the security guy at the gate. For them, the priest is full of the Holy Spirit, but the security guy is full of uh, ancestral spirits. So, he doesn't deserve respect. We must avoid that. And when somebody is, fa is foundling or stumbling in his job or duty, the person is not connecting with the leadership or the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they did their work. So, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, let us prioritize. Let us not neglect one for the other when they are all good. Hierarchies of good things. And let us learn to submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And when we do all this, we are following the way, the truth, and the life, which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is a perfect example of all this. He never neglected any good thing for the other. He did all things where he prioritized. He knew his priority. He did not neglect. He was led by the Holy Spirit. So we pray today that the Lord will continue to um, nourish us and 
Make us wiser than we have been. Make us efficient in our works as God's children in the world. And to always follow the way, the truth, and the life through Christ our Lord. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, he For the sake of his sorrowful passion.